If Pokemon was rebooted, would we get new ways to explore the environments with new mechanics for finding Pokemon in the wild? For most topics in this design study, I will try to explore as many different ideas as time allows for, but for this topic, I'll really only be exploring one idea as completely as I can. This is because... It's an idea I would really like to see in a Pokemon game. I try to keep my own biases in check, however, this time I'm using my bias as a way to explore further. I want to look into how the Pokemon appear in the wild, not just in tall grass, and how they relate to the environment around them. In my previous episode where I talked about remapping the world of Pokemon, I talked about what a reboot could really mean for the world map how many familiar elements to Pokemon's locations could come back in refreshing ways. A big part of drawing a map is filling it in with all the wonders of nature, and a big part of nature are the animals that contribute to it. As I mentioned in that video, this means that a major decision for world building is whether or not animals, separate from Pokemon, exist in this world. See, the Pokemon games have made references to our own world despite there being only a few recognizable things about it. There have been mentions to countries such as America or China, and to Earth's animals as well. Pikachu being a mouse Pokemon implies the existence of mice on their own. Apparently, before the invention of Pokeballs, by which to call these creatures pocket monsters, they were simply called magical creatures. Although that is never mentioned in any of the mainline games, and as a note on terminology, if all the creatures had magical powers, then you wouldn't denote them as magical, you would just call them creatures. Otherwise, you are implying the existence of non-magical creatures. Now, if it is true that both magical and non-magical creatures exist and are present, what does that look like? Because we could indeed have normal animals in that world, with the definition of a Pokemon being that they are the animals of the magical variety. Would we not see a normal cat sitting next to a litten? Salmon swimming upstream with Magikarp? A cow grazing with a Miltank? As funny as I think that is, it would probably break immersion. So let's decide to keep them separate. No ordinary animals, just Pokemon. Going forward, Pokemon have to fulfill all the roles in our ecosystems. Well, hold on. That is actually a very tall order for them to deliver on. Most of the work in our ecosystems is performed by insects. Take them away and most life on Earth would soon die off. If many hands make light work, then the roughly estimated 10 quintillion insects must be doing something important. In order for Pokemon to replace them, there are two things we have to do to their design. Firstly, have a lot of Pokemon in great variety to do all the things to make an ecosystem work. Secondly, have a lot of them be incredibly small to be able to do that work, much smaller than a Pokeball. Obviously, this is ridiculous. Now we have billions of bug-type Pokemon outnumbering all the others, and it would be a joke to see a mosquito use a move like Hurricane. Now, I think I can hear the distinct sound of people typing in the comments that I'm taking this way too seriously. I assure you, though, these are all the basic kinds of questions and research you have to do when designing an alien world. Sometimes we have to get the dumb answers to our dumb questions out of the way because knowing what we don't want is just as important as knowing what we do. Alrighty, so insects stay as we know them and Pokemon just replace the animals. That is not to say that bug-type Pokemon no longer exist, they still do, but they are of significant size and they just don't fill that typical function in nature. At least, not as fully as the real bugs do. You might find Butterfree in a field of flowers with actual butterflies, Bee drills bumbling with real bees, and that is okay. That is something I can live with. Besides, here in Australia, you can get spiders the size of cats and dogs, so it fits fine to have Pokemon usually no smaller than that. The last element to consider when designing an ecosystem is the whole other half of it. The plants, the flora. True enough, Pokemon is not a game about studying plants. However, you have a world filled with magical animals. Should the environment they have a relationship with not be equally magical? Or at the very least, has evolved in response to their destructive power by being equally tough, aggressive, and as diverse as Pokemon? Since I'm talking about my own preferences, I would love to see and explore an environment that was just as wild and magical as Pokemon are. 
for it to be filled with fantasy flowers and trees, wonders and secrets that if you take the time to understand, you can use to find Pokemon that would otherwise never come looking for you. An interesting example of this is Pokemon Snap. You throw items around the environment in hopes of creating interactions that provoke Pokemon into coming out of their hiding places. Fair enough though, this whole idea does sound a little overly ambitious for a Pokemon game. On the other hand, they make billions of dollars, so heck yeah, let's build that into the core games too. We can do that, right? Okay, so we've talked about the world building side of things, but that still leaves the matter of how these ecosystems will be designed and implemented into the games. We can break this down into two parts. The game mechanics of how we find and interact with the Pokemon, and how we visually see the world that has been constructed. We'll start with the Pokemon, but just as a small disclaimer, as I go through these mechanics, I'm not necessarily talking about open world gameplay. I believe these techniques can happen for more linear experiences too. When we look at many of the mainline games in the past, Pokemon have been placed a little bit randomly. Individually, they usually match their environment well, but looking at an area as a whole and what you can find in them, they can look a little awkward standing next to each other, or downright out of place. Having Pokemon hide in tall grass helps disguise this awkwardness, but that is a mechanic I grew tired of many years ago. It was perfect for the much older handheld consoles, but we have much more powerful devices now. It's been proven to be extremely awesome in the most recent games to actually see the Pokemon wander the fields, caves, and forests. What is not awesome is seeing the Pokemon just pop into existence right in front of you. For Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, it was from Tall Grass, and for Sword and Shield, it was just a horrifically short draw call distance. Personally, I would prefer to not have them pop in at all if possible. Let them be seen from some distance away and spawn from behind boulders, trees, rolling hills, whatever. Predators on the prowl, herds of Pokemon clumped together as they wander the field, birds in the sky, make it feel alive. As they are now, they don't look like they are living in their environment, they are just kind of meandering. There are plenty of techniques in game development to be able to cheat the drawing distance of too many models on the screen, and I'll talk about that in a moment. From what I can see of the upcoming game Pokemon Legends Arceus, although the graphical style looks to be improved, the gameplay still looks largely similar to Sword and Shield's Wild Area. Thankfully, it seems to be much bigger, but I still don't expect to see Pokemon doing things beyond just meandering again. Obviously, this is an early look and not the final product. Things will be improved, of course, and I'll be overjoyed to be wrong here. But, as of this recording, the release date is only a few months away. That is not a lot of time. I can tell you, as a game developer, it takes time to make an open world game good. If you would like to know more of my thoughts on that game and how Pokemon could better work in an open world genre, you can check out that video. Anyway, one of the challenges of having so many Pokemon filling in a small area is that all those models need to be loaded into memory, ready to go for the player to encounter. That is probably the leading factor behind that very short draw call distance in Sword and Shield. However, if the environment is made more dynamic and the Pokemon in them more spread out, then you could have Snorlax already loaded into the environment and seen way off into the distance. If there are flocks of birds in the sky, then the fact that they are all the same Spearow model helps create lots of copies from far away instead of needing eight different Pokemon models on hand to create that flock. Also, low polygon models, such as for the birds group together, would mean that you wouldn't have to know just exactly what Pokemon they were until you were close enough to see details and then load them in. What I don't want is for any environment to feel overcrowded with variety and come across as awkward. Obviously, I think that Sword and Shield is the strongest example of the world being cluttered. When you walk around the wild area, the designers wanted to pack so much in that I wondered just how could so many different species possibly get along in this space? You know what it's like, you're biking along on a clear day, maybe spot something interesting as you go, when suddenly the weather changes and you have a completely different roster of Pokemon spawning around you. The variety to catch was actually one of my favourite things about Sword and Shield, but how it was arranged just felt so unnatural. 
as if there should have been much greater distances to cover so the territories of these creatures could have some room to breathe. Enough so that environments can organically mix together and ecosystems could feel solidly established. When I see a Pokemon, I want to be able to immediately recognize what it contributes to that environment or why it is there. That is not to say that the mainline games have entirely failed at this. In fact, it is because I occasionally find such great moments where I'm exploring an environment and come across a Pokemon that just feels like it belongs there and that I have discovered it. It is these few examples of how well it could be done that it makes the janky parts more awkward and most of it is janky, which is not entirely a bad thing. It was okay for many years, just let me catch them, but a reboot is the perfect time to build a system with better gameplay. For an example of just how beautifully awesome this can be done, look at Monster Hunter World. And I'm not just talking about the fauna, but the flora as well. Its ecosystem is filled with wonders, yet none of it feels out of place. I desperately want that same feeling for Pokemon. It's almost as if the concept of Pokemon was tailor-made for that kind of experience. With this in mind, let's get into the second part about how to build and represent the environment in which we find our magical beasts. When an environment is designed, the condition of that environment should take the creatures that are in it into account. How do these two interact and impact on each other? While out exploring, you may find evidence of how the nests created by Bidoof have forced the shape of the river to change over time. If a player hears about a very rare Pokemon that loves a specific flower, they should be able to find that flower in the middle of a forest somewhere and then get to hunting. If you walk into an open patch of twigs and dead grass in that forest, you can recognize that you just clumsily strolled into the den of a Nidoking. King. Like I said, Pokemon makes billions of dollars from their games, so investing a few dozen more millions of dollars isn't going to stop them from still making the billions. The Monster Hunter franchise doesn't make anywhere near the amount of money that Pokemon does, yet they commit a higher budget to creating these environments because they know it is a worthwhile investment. Pokemon's own environments can achieve that same quality, or at least a baseline improvement overall, without impacting sales negatively. The feelings I would hope to inspire with this idea of enhancing the ecosystems is that the player is going about discovering and tracking down Pokemon for documentation and taming, that we are explorers on a mission. I would think that could even inspire a sense of danger as you never know what might walk around the corner and charge at you. Sword and Shield really made a good start on that very feeling when we could encounter high-level Pokemon in the wild area right from the start. Now, I think, it could really go to greater levels of excitement. When exploring the nooks and crannies, it would be very important to have a narrative context to tie together why the protagonist is going around everywhere. Of course, we have the Pokedex to fill out, but so far that has been presented as just an old man's dream, while the real task is to become the very best like no one ever was. The champion. I would probably try to flip that around if I could, and in fact, I'm going to do just that in my first narrative topic. With these ecosystems in mind, I think the games are at their best when we are discovering new Pokemon and trading them with our friends, instead of grinding to create the perfect team and become that best ever champion. I believe that was even the vision Satoshi Tajiri had for the original games. He didn't battle the insects he found as a child. He collected them. Or so he says. That'll do for this episode. I know I put in the disclaimer at the start that I'm not trying to fix Pokemon, and then I go on this ridiculous rant. But I figure I may as well just let loose for one episode and then move on. I choose my battles very selectively. Now that I've let you know my thoughts, let me know yours. I'll be looking through the comments and talking about them in a follow-up discussion video. I want to know how you feel not just about my ideas, but what ideas would you like to see in Pokemon? What would tickle your intrigue in the open world of Pokemon Legends Arceus? Or would you rather go back to 2D sprites and tall grass? Why? Like, subscribe, hit the blossom, and continue to be wonderful to each other. I'll see you next time.
Hey, so I just want to take a minute at the end here to thank my video editor, Silverstitch. I wouldn't be able to make any of these videos at all if it wasn't for them. So thank you, Silver. I am eternally grateful and am very excited to go on this journey into game design with you. All my love and appreciation. Thank you so much for your wonderful work.